sort of experiments and case studies to be done on the prospects for applying those techniques in modeling, in the modeling area. I think there's there's tremendous opportunities there. Okay, um, so those are some comments on on, on processes. Um, I know it sounds a bit dry, but um, turns out they're 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 really uh, very important considerations um, to be had. Okay, um, I'd like to now um, talk about another set of um, of processes, and those related to these are related to, to technical issues. And again, this is somewhat of a of an arbitrary division. I'm I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable with the, the sort of dichotomous classification. Um, so uh, a fair number of these have to do with um, defensive, what it's called defensive programming and, and offensive programming. Um, I talked about assertions this morning. Um, so an assertion is a sanity check during program's execution to help confirm that one's assumptions hold true. It explicitly documents your assumption in a way they can be computationally checked. Okay? Um, this helps identify mistaken understanding on yours or other parts logic errors, inconsistency, and reasoning. It turns out that it also documents the assumptions, which is very important. When people look at your model, they could see your assumption that the population has at least one person in it. Or maybe it needs two people so that the variance of a quantity can be, can be um, assessed. Or they'll see your assumption that um, a person's speed needs to be between x and y, or what, what have you. Um, so an assertion attempts to document these assumptions so that if they are found to be inaccurate, you are alerted as quickly as possible. Now this may seem perverse to those who are not exposed to this idea previously. It may seem bizarre that you will want your program to crash, to put it crudely, that you will want your program to die. But it is highly desirable if it's compared with an insidious error that is, is basically giving nonsensical results and doing so without you realizing it. Given the choice between a model that won't run and a model that runs but gives results that are simply very far off and erroneous um, silently, I think virtually everyone in the room, probably everyone in the room would, would agree that it's better to have a model that simply won't run that forces you to bring your assumptions back in line with, with the actual situation. And assertions document these assumptions as well. So for people going over the model, they can see these assumptions. They help reduce the likelihood an error will slip through. As I said, it helps discourage lazy handling of just the common case, forces developers to deal explicitly with a bug before continuing, and helps reduce debugging time. Often when there's a bug, it manifests in a failed assertion. That assertion will fail often much closer to where the actual problem is than would an ultimate failure on it in other areas. You may have your model run all the way through and only output gibberish, and you only notice it at the end of the model when really that error occurred in the first few seconds of model operation. Meanwhile, that assertion might fail within a few seconds and allow you to sort of zero in on it. It helps improve the thoroughness of tests. It also rules out possible explanations for errors sometimes by helping you realize, okay, I've checked that already. It's not this that's causing the problem. That was, we already checked that it's not null. So, so what is this? Okay, so for example, this is in a um, model, um, model, model idea um, a number of years ago now. Um, where, where I'm computing um, the uh, sort of person from a, a set of coordinates. And I ask, okay, are these legal coordinates in the first place? Before I, before I give back a number, I want to know, uh, is, this a, is this a legal set of coordinates? Um, or, or I want to check, has something been computed before I go ahead and use it? Maybe this thing isn't yet initialized, and I, I want to actually check that it's been filled, uh, filled in. Um, or maybe I want to check, check my uh, assumptions regarding some, some computation. Um, so for example, I, I have uh, indices of neighbors, and I calculate, um, I calculate uh, an index uh, from this dx, dy, 
and I make sure that it isn't ourselves in some strange, uh, strange way. Um, so, uh, you know, make sure that this calculation gave a meaningful result. Okay, um, turns out that um, this may vary quite a bit by, um, by uh, version of any logic. Um, but um, in some versions of any logic, you need to have virtual machine arguments minus enable assertions associated with a simulation. Um, and that will double check to make sure that your assertions within the program, like this one, are actually double checked. Okay. Um, now, I should note that when you declare an assertion, like this one here, you can actually put an error message to be displayed if, there, if the assertion fails. So if this fails, you could say, for example, neighbors shouldn't be ourselves or something like that, and it will, it will print that out. So these things, when you run your model, these things are running all the time. They can be just running, 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 and they're just looking for mis possible mistakes. And if they find them, they'll alert you by causing an obvious problem. Okay, so that's what we call offensive programming. Taking, taking the errors, you know, taking the, the, um, uh, taking the defense to the errors, um, making sure that you man you manifest them as quickly as possible. You engage them as quickly as possible. So that's uh, assertions. Let's talk about defensive programming. These things are oft ignored, and I I I offered payons to them in this boot camp. but that's wrong. In the human theater, it has huge significance. If you look at code with good formatting, it's just much, much clearer than code with um, where formatting conventions uh, are not applied. Um, and uh, most of the, the models that I've uh, provided out here um, have um, a pretty good formatting um, in them, and, and you could look to them as, as, as some examples. Um, the, uh, uh, th there's some other models that um, I haven't really discussed in class, but which, uh, which are notable. I'll uh, show, show one example here, um, just from something uh, that I'm hoping still to be able to present. So for example, this uh, net immigration rate. So uh, you know, here's an example of, of uh, some formatted code. And you'll notice, you notice these particular conventions um, where, where things are indented. Uh, inside statements, and this is just vastly easier than doing something like like this, where you have everything pulled over to the left hand side like that. This is this is basically much much harder to understand what what is going on. It's far better to have something along these lines, where the formatting clearly indicates the logical depth of different portions of the code. Okay. Um, so I'd also suggest separating commands and queries, separating methods that do, that change something versus methods that compute something. And avoid constants being scattered through your program. The people in, in the uh, Java tutorials have heard this maybe more than they'd like, but it's extremely fragile to scatter, to sta scatter con um, constants within your code. So the wandering elephants example is a prime example of what not to do when it comes to constants in your code. Let me, let me show you um, a few examples uh, from that. Um, so if we go to uh, example models, and um, we go down to wandering elephants here. Wandering elephants was the source of the uh, CWD. And if we go, go look, for example, at elephant, and go look at some of its um, some of its code here, um, you'll find that there are these, oh my gosh, oh, it's even worse than I remember. Um, well, we'll find that there are these things scattered throughout here. Five, zero, 99, 10,000. And what's worse is that they re recur 
at many, many different places. A hundred, ten, five hundred, a thousand here, uh, and this is not unique to, to this area of code. If we go look at uh, the various functions, say heading to random, if we click here on, on heading to random, let's go see that. Okay, why, why am I not seeing that? Okay, here's uh, set velocity, and once again, you'll find you'll find a whole bunch of constants in there, 100. So let me ask this, if you wanted now to change, to, to go up here to main, and you wanted to, to, to enlarge this space, where is the size of a space encoded? Can anyone tell me? Where's the size of it, the number of grid cells here? Columns and rows, where would that be? Excuse me, actually, I shouldn't say columns and rows here. It's, it, normally it's in the environment. In this case, actually, it's a continuous 2D environment. So I, I shouldn't have, I'm asking you a trick question in a way, because um, it is continuous 2D. But that's where the space size is defined, that's 500, okay? So that's, that's good enough. Can I ask you a quick question there? Sure. So you're, so you're just talking about the hard-coding thing. Yeah. So if you, um, if you want to say calculate something based on the grid size, yeah. how would you maybe grab that size, that number like 500? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I do in just a second, okay? You'll notice here that this altitude is 100 by 100. This vegetation is also 100 by 100. Is that an accident or is that the same? Does that have to be? Is it logically the same number because it has to be? Or are those just happenstance that those are the same? Now tell me, wh where does, how does that number relate, if any, to this, this, to this thousand here? Or, or for that matter, in this heading towards water, to this, to this sort of plus equals five here, this hundred here, or is this hundred here? How does it relate? If I want to change it to be a width of 300, um, which of these would I need to update? Which, which things here? Um, I'm guessing probably I'd have to update this 100. I'm guessing this is, okay, it says it's outside the area, so probably I'd have to update it at these places too. But, but riddle me this. So if I did that, uh, if I change it to 300 and updated those, now I look at this code. Um, Look at that code. Okay, do I have to update this five? These things are, where did, where did that come from? How about this 10,000? Is that 100 by 100 or is it, did that come from somewhere else? I think it's 100 by 100. I think that's why, but but may, maybe not. Or how about this 500? Probably that's the, the width of the space. Or this 100, um, do I have to update that? How about this 99? If I went and I searched everywhere for 100, I could find a whole bunch, but I wouldn't see this 99. Is that 99 to 100 minus 1, logically? Is, that, is it the width of the space minus 1? It's all opaque, folks. This is just asking for disaster. <laughs> Zombie elephants? Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is really disaster in the making. I mean, um, you, you change it in some places, not in others. Things blow up. You don't know why. You don't know what's linked logically to whatever. Now, it's good practice to abstract. It's good practice to parameterize, to make these things like 500 and 100 and these things like uh, 10,000 be explicit, be explicit on what they depend on. Just as within a system dynamics diagram, we build up we, we put constants into the model, we name them, and we build up other functions in terms of those. That allows us to change those constants in the future. It allows us to see how other things ex explicitly see how they depend on them. So now I'd like you to open up a different model that I wrote. Um, actually, I wrote it this morning at about um, 6.30 to 7.30. Um, uh, and it's called Gridded System Dynamics. It's from the M drive, OK? Um, so um, if, you go to, if you go to that model, and I'm going to go close some of these, um, these things up here. I'd like to show you a, show you a different way, um, one that illustrates this whole issue of, of kind of parameterizing, OK? Um, so let's, let's go uh, check out a model. Now, this model is going to have many features to it. And I'd like to actually return to this as an example of a hybrid model. but. Um, Let's, let's, go, um, let's go check it out. So this gridded system dynamics, 
Let's go to main. My focus right now is this issue of constants, okay? So, so okay, so once again, we have these things over here, so they're, we hide them. What is this doing? Well, I should probably tell you, like the wandering elephants, it has a grid. Um, and um, in this case, it's a kind of spatially separated grid. Um, and here we have differential equations applying in each of several patches, which are computing both endogenous dynamics associated with maturation of, of some sort of creatures and migration in from net migration from neighboring areas and deaths of these creatures as well. And different patches will have different concentrations. For example, here's a patch which has a high concentration of critters, and here's a patch with a low concentration of critters. Um, here's one who's, uh, which, is, which is varying. This is system dynamics, and if we, if we could slow it down, we'll see these stocks and flows play out in a more stately pace. Um, and we can click on, on these things and display a little graph of them. Um, ooh, look at that. Um, uh, mature cells, okay, that's, that's mighty interesting. Um, uh, it looks to me like the, the integration needs to uh, take place a little bit more more frequently there. But um, in any case, uh, so, so we have these uh, variations. We have uh, patch populations. And this is all animated and what, what things depend on what is indicated. But let's talk about these patches now. Um, uh, one thing that's kind of uh, interesting here is I might want to go from, from uh, one patch size of 20 by 20 so maybe I want to go by 50 by 50, right? Right? Um, maybe that's that's what I want instead. <coughs> so so maybe I don't want to do it on top of this experiment. Maybe what I want to do is actually um, create a new experiment. Okay. Um, so a new experiment here. Um, new experiment. Uh, and I want to say big, you know, um, um, big. Um, big space or something like that. Um, obviously, I'd probably give it a, a, real, a better name if I was to do that. Okay, now the parameters for it, I should have specified default values. This is going to be 520 true, and then I'm going to use the big ones, 500. Um, so that's actually an aspect of robustness. You should you specify defaults as was suggested, true. And then I want to make it maybe 50 by 50, okay? Um, so now, now we'll we'll go resize this thing, and 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 we can run this, and now we have something more similar to that, and um, it it exhibits these kind of interesting local dynamics, which look oddly like the game of life, even though they're continuous in system dynamics, um, which is quite quite fascinating actually. Um, okay, so so here we've changed the size of space. How do we do that? How would we do that in the wandering elephants? Could we, could we do that in the wandering elephants? Just plug in numbers for new experiments, change the size of the space? New, it's what we call hard-coded, hard-wired. It would be extremely painful. You have to take a very good, skilled, any logic developer, maybe someone with software engineering experience and set them to it, and maybe they could do it in the course of a day, something like that. There I could do it in seconds. H how is that? Well, let's go see, ladies and gentlemen, Behold the power of abstraction. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. So, so let's go um, and parameterization. Let's go check out environment. Okay, let's go check out environment in the gridded system dynamics model, and let's go look under advanced. Okay, here we see a, a width and height of 500. I'm not planning to change that. But columns and rows are dictated by these things: count patch columns, count patch rows. What do you think those things are? They begin with P, end with S? Parameters. Those are parameters. Count patch rows, pat, count patch columns. OK. So what's the big deal? OK, so we can put those in there. That makes it expand. Well, well, OK, now how about the, what else would we need to specify? If we change those, what else would need to be specified? What else would need to change? Hmm. What else would need to change if we change those parameters? Okay. So you put those in main and they're visible within the environment? Uh, so, so yeah, they're visible in the environment. Yeah, any, any variable in main is visible in the environment. And then un under patches, the replication is given as this. This is what I was looking for, but um, it's true. We have to do it everywhere they're using the code. So number of replicated objects, it's not 10,000. 
Remember in Wandering Elephants, it was 10,000? And presumably that was because 100 by 100? Presumably? Presumably? Um, uh, but, but here, count patch rows times count patch columns, right? OK, so we have that many replicated objects. That's consistent. We don't hard code it there. Where else might it, might, might it need to be specified? Well, let's go look at in patch. Um, here we have in patch the definition of a system dynamics model giving these kind of endogenous dynamics and net migration um, into and out of it. Now, where is migration cl classified? OK, so this is, I'm simultaneously showing you a hybrid model here. I'm, I'm securing dual use from this lecture. Um, so here's this, hybrid, uh, this model. Let's go look at net migration. Net migration depends on net migration rate. So that's calling a what? What is that calling? It's calling a, a function. Okay. Let's go net immigration rate, rather. Net immigration rate. Let's go click on that. Here's the code for that. Um, OK. Um, OK, so if, if there are no neighboring patches yet, um, return 0. OK, otherwise, go over each of the neighboring patches and uh, for each neighboring patch, um, perform a, a little calculation, sort of a, a heat, heat equation type of thing. You have multiply coefficient times the difference in the number. We're assuming here mature, mature um, items are the only ones that can migrate, like deer. The fawns won't migrate between areas, but the, the, the bucks will. Um, so here, uh, some coefficient times the difference. For some organisms, such as sea lice, this would be that only the babies migrate. Right? Um, it would be a difference in, in the baby, the number of babies. So here we have a net immigration rate. So the idea is if our patch has more than this other neighboring, sorry, the neighboring patch has more than us, we'll have a net influx of these things. Uh, otherwise, vice versa. Okay. Um, so um, that's all well and good. But where's the reference to to the number of uh, sort of the width of the cells? Well, I don't really see it. Um, maybe. Um, Maybe in, in figuring out what the neighboring patches are. Well, that uses a variable called neighboring patches, and that's partly for performance reason. What are what are the what is the the value of this? Uh, how does that va uh, value get set? Well, okay. Um, uh, I should probably have a, a separate function for this. Call it for toroidal, and then break this off into a separate function. This is too long for a function up here. But look at this. If the space is toroidal, oh, if it's not toroidal, just get the regular get neighbors uh, that any logic provides. But if it's toroidal, that means we have kind of a donut. We have kind of it on both sides, it wraps around, and, and north and south, it wraps around. Okay? Um, so we have the option of doing it either way, the power of parameterization. This is, what is this? What is this thing? It's, what do you think it is? Where does it live? It lives in, it lives in Maine. And it's a it's a um, it's a parameter. It's a parameter specified. And in fact, I specified it. Watch this. Um, I'm going to just pop up for a second. But if I if I went down to big space, you'll notice among the parameters I said is for space toroid. Yeah, I want a toroid space. Let's suppose. If I don't want if I don't want a toroid space, I can just disable that, and and it will work. It'll work directly. Okay. So that's great. Um, but let's go look at this code more. Um, OK, so this is finding out the, excuse me, uh, not, a, not immigration, one the other one. One and get neighboring patches. OK, so now here, um, what do I do? OK, so I, I get the count of rows and count columns. Ah, now this is where it is. OK, I get it from the environment, actually. I get it from the environment. So whatever the environment has for count of rows, count of columns, I get it from there and use it consistently. And then I actually figure out sort of, OK, um, we have a current row, and the current row minus 1. If the current row is 0, that's minus 1. And I, I, I take it and perform. And then it would be count of rows minus 1, essentially. So it wraps, wraps around. And then I get the environment at each of these cells. I get the, the neighbor, uh, reference the neighbor at each of those cells and put them in neighboring patches. So this, this allows me to, again, have it totally parameterized by count rows. I don't have to worry about hard coding you know, the, the size of the space in there. It's all, it's all parameterized. It's, in this case, it uses the size of the environment as a robust indication of what, what's the count of columns and count of rows um, that we're dealing with. And, and really, that's, 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 there's not much more to it than that. Now, 
If I had a need to iterate over each cell, go from zero to count rows minus one, I would do zero to count rows minus one. I didn't, wouldn't do zero to, to 99, which is incredibly fragile, because you don't know where that 99 came from. Is it the name of the restaurant in the States, Ranch 99? Or, you know, is it, or, or the, the, the supermarket in Irvine, California, Ranch 99? Um, is it, is it, um, is it the, the name of, uh, is it the number of, of columns, or is it just an accident of one-fifth of the, of the um, visual space minus one? That's totally unclear. By giving things names and using them explicitly, and even if you know the value, you think you know the value, writing out the formula for it, like, current, like, like um, count rows minus one or something like that, or count rows times two plus one, that just makes it much clearer what your thinking is, what your logic is, and it helps you find bugs easier because it's laid out, it's laid bare. So this is an example of a model that's a little bit more robust. And it, you know, it, it, it's not like it took horribly much longer to, to, to create. It probably took less time because in the process of debugging it, I, all I could do is, you know, I could switch it from a big space to a small space very easily. I could just switch it back and forth and see it run for a small one, for a big one, um, test it with different sizes, um, have it go faster with a small space so I could, I could look at it, etc. So abstracting these things through parameterization is, is really a powerful technique and it will lend you flexibility. It will lend you flexibility in the evolution of your, of your code. Okay, so, um, uh, so that, will be, uh, that will be your friend. Um, computer science, they say, is the science of abstraction. And um, much of our lives is spent avoiding repeating, avoiding risks by creating good abstractions. Abstractions with appropriate parameters that avoid us having to do extra work, um, avoid us having to put out extra risks, uh, create extra vulnerabilities. Okay, so what are some additional things? Um, well, okay. Um, Right, uh, naming conventions. Yeah, try to use Java's naming conventions. Um, um, use commenting, uh, indenting, module naming, that's good. Uh, uh, so you try to reduce the risk of errors. Um, so these are some suggestions on Java's things. Lowercase alphabetics uh, for packages. Um, you're really not gonna be doing that. First word of each class capitalized. If you create your own classes like person and deer, um, give it a a first, um, uh, first capitalization methods or functions should be lowercase. First thing, um, uh, action methods, methods that do things should be called something that sounds like a verb, like perform this, calculate that, so on. Um, and in local variables are traditionally lowercase too. Booleans, uh, it's traditional to use uh, in Java to use is or to use has, has this, is that that sort of thing, um, was this. Um, so suggestions, use consistent abbreviation conventions, um, avoid similar names, be careful of similar letters. Um, uh, this is actually a, a real issue that came up yesterday. One of the participants who remained nameless um, was struggling with a model that was exhibiting very strange behavior and it took me a while to figure out what it is. It was just a clash between two things that had the same name. Sometimes it was interpreting that name one way, sometimes it was interpreting the other way because they had somewhat different scopes uh, associated with them. And so, you know, it, it would it exhibit this kind of weird behavior, um, which is unusual. It gave weird, weird, weird warnings from the, from the build, from the compiler. And I couldn't figure them out because it didn't seem to make sense why it would apply to this sort of thing. It would have a warning like that. And then I realized there's two of those things. They're just with different, the same name. Avoid, avoid overloading names. Overloading names is not for the faint of heart, and um, uh, there are some reasons to do it in more advanced topics, but, but uh, you do it in structured situations like you have inheritance and you have um, one name and another name, or you have two methods that do the same work. There's, well, there's overloading and overriding. I won't get into it. Um, but basically, there's some reasons for, for doing it at certain points, but try to avoid doing it um, if you're just getting started. It, it can be very, very confusing. Um, and it, it caused yourself lots of grief. Um, one way to do that is to, l to give different types of names to different types of variables. So, um, so for, 
variables within a class um, that are sort of uh, well, variables you've added to the class, you might call them m, m something with a, a lowercase m as the first one, meaning that they're sort of a member of that class. Um, some people do it that way to distinguish very clearly by the name what sort of thing it is. Okay, so a, a function is named in a way that's quite different from a variable. Um, right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to uh, comment on that. Um, okay, outputting to console. We saw that earlier. Uh, I mentioned that any logic files are in XML, and you can take advantage of them sometimes. You can you can inspect them, see what's in there. They do completely specify your model, which is um, which is uh, attractive. So those were some um, some sort of high level comments. Let me just see if there's any really important ones that um, I'm missing now. Um, oh yeah, folks, if you see many conditions, the same condition coming up again and again and again in code. See if you can put it in a central place and give it a name like is alive rather than just checking, okay, are they in this state? Are they in that? You're checking here if they're in this in a certain state, checking this other place if they're in that certain state, this other place if they're in a certain state. Why? Because your state diagram might evolve and might, that state might bifurcate into two states. And then you'd have to go fix it in three different places, five different places. Give it a, a clear name. Minimize, well, okay, so I, that's that's not so important here. Um, checking return values, uh, make sure that something returned a meaningful uh, value. If it can return a value, even if you don't intend to use it, you can check to make sure it's, um, it didn't return null. Um, if you have a switch statement, uh, those are not in the Java tutorial, uh, forgive me um, if you're not already familiar with switches. Switches handle a bunch of cases. They're kind of like a multi-way if kind of check this condition, that condition, that condition. Always try to handle all cases, all possible cases, um, even if this indicate that some of them are illegal. Just don't let it go past you. It's a great opportunity to find if it's illegal. Um, it's an illegal value. Um, always put, you can always put uh, begin colon, um, and, you know, begin curly braces, end curly braces after an end. Uh, sometimes you put in two lines there thinking they're both under it, and it turns out one of them. Um, uh, right. Um, try not to reuse temporary variables. Um, people build up sometimes bad habits uh, in high school. On um, uh, right. Um, and uh, sometimes you want to describe sort of what this thing should do before you actually write the code for it. Um, I think these are these. These have a bunch of of, of sort of good comments there. So I'm going to conclude the lecture um, with that. Are there any questions on that sort of material? So it's about 3.30 now. Um, I promised uh, people some time to work on, um, on projects here. Um, how many people would like to see the details of how a, so d does anyone want how many people would like to see more details on this hybrid system dynamics modeling with Asia-based? Well, that's one of them. And then there's a separate one um, called CTL state variable, um, which is um, also an example model. It's called CTL state variable. Actually, there's another called flu immuno epi, which is also there, which is in the, um, uh, oh, okay. So. So I already have flu amino epi open, sorry. Um, let me close this one. Uh, close, boom. Um, ooh, okay. And then, um, and then uh, I want to open CTL state variable. This one is particularly easy to, to understand. Maybe I'll just say a couple words about this. Um, so uh, so this, this gridded one, here we basically have um, the patch one I've just been speaking about. Basically, we have system dynamics pa uh, associated with each patch, and the patches are placed into a 2D grid, okay? Um, and um, I'm going to close this. Um, they're placed into a 2D grid, and uh, each patch is exhibiting dynamics both that are endogenous and through this thing here, um, the, uh, they have net inflow or outflow to other neighboring patches. And... Um, uh, the way it's it's basically done is you, you get the neighbors um, here in, in either a toroid or not, and then you um, 
And then you compute the immigration from from this formula involving for each neighbor in turn, you figure out how many net come into it or out of it. Um, and um, basically what this is taking advantage of is that you can just call off to this method and the method can compute some rate of flow into net migration. Okay. Um, now for a CTL state variable, it's kind of similar, but it's um, different in that we have people within a network. Okay. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at um, this simulation here just to give you a, a sense of it at first. Um, so um, what we have here is people, um, people within this network getting sick over time. And um, I was running that a bit fast. Let me, let me slow that down. Um, okay, so, so, so here we have people within a network. And these people are arranged in this ring lattice network, and the infection is propagating from person to person within this network. Okay, um, and and it may start with this index case, and and then it's spreading out. And these people, the the size encodes one thing, and the redness encodes another. I believe the size is the number of immune the CTL cells, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes built up, and the red is how many viral, uh, the, the viral load of each person. And you can see it's starting to spread out here um, along the periphery. And um, uh, here actually you see um, some, um, uh, a, a stock and flow at the global level, which is accumulating population-wide um, uh, population-wide viral load, I believe, uh, across the population. And let's go down and look at what's going on the individual level. On the individual level, we have a, a simple set of state variables. This is from, I believe, it was uh, Nowak and, and, and Wadar's work on um, dynamics originally associated with, uh, with HIV, but applied to other, other conditions. And so within an individual, we have this system. And this, uh, this flow here represents virions from neighbors. So there's a formula associated with this, which loops over all neighbors in the network and adds up the viral particles from those, or the rate of flow of viral particles from that neighbor. So if we go into person here, here's this, the uh, stocks and flows for the person, and um, here's the variance from neighbors, and it's omega times total viral load of neighbors, um, and uh, total viral load of neighbors, um, how do you think that's defined? Total viral load of neighbors. Well, it's, um, this could actually, uh, so for each neighbor, so we get the neighbors first. We get to know the neighbors. We get the connections. And then for each neighbor, if there's no neighbors, we just return zero. There's no viral load. Otherwise, we go over each neighbor and we add up into our accumulated amount the amount in their viral load, and then we return that value. And so that influences this um, rate of flow into V here. And then, and then these things flow. Um, uh, these are uh, uninfected cells, infected cells. These are viral load up there. And this is, um, this is a, a particularly simple version of the model where we have a single um, CTL uh, variable. And, and then uh, where do you think the people's uh, colors and um, and uh, their, their uh, width they're set. How do you think we made them expand in that sort of way? Anyone want to say? How, how did we make them expand visually? Well, all we did is, is we went to, hey, come on, um, come on. Oops, there we go. Um, this is all we did. So dynamic properties associated with it. Okay, we have people color and then the radius is five times the state variable Z, and the radius Y and radius X are both five times the state variable Z, Z here, okay. Um, the other one is actually a, a somewhat nicer um, way of doing it for setting their color. Here we depend on it updating the color variable, here the setting color. The one I just showed you with the grid cells, it actually just, um, it, it, it computes it based on, on some threshold in, in the level. Anyway, this is, um, this is tied into a network, 
The reason it's tied into a network is because total viral load of network of neighbors gets the connections of this person. So it just gets the connections, it computes their, their load. This is a, another example hybrid model. It's a hybrid model where the neighbors influence the flow into this uh, to the state variable. And this is amenable to a discrete or to a continuous transition. You'll notice there's also a discrete transition um, from living to dead. And, um, and uh, this, this uh, transitions if V is greater than some viral, fatal viral uh, level threshold. Okay. So if, if it's above a certain level, they move from the living state into a dead state. Oh, I, I found out also um, that, uh, that it's <laughs> a, student, a student went through my slides and they found that, that actually I had a slide so, so remember I told you I went through a quite elaborate lecture on, on, on well, that's exaggerating, but I went through a discussion about that state charts have to be independent, they can't have common things. Well, a student went through my lectures and found I had, a, I had an illustration of a model of mine that had several state charts going to the same final state, which is exactly what, um, what Diana had been asking about. So Diana found this, um, and uh, it's true. If you go to the uh, TB risk factors model, it shows how you can have multiple state charts. They all go to the same final state. And, and that final state is sort of the, the final state. What I can't be absolutely sure is whether that triggers the person in the other model to also, like in the other state chart to go to there, or they could still be fluctuating within that state chart. I'm not certain, but apparently you can share final states, okay? Um, anyway, um, so that's CTL state variable. Um, and there's one called flu immunoapy that, that provides additional sort of uh, depth of, of, of focus that was from a, a research project. Okay, so um, those are some, um, some example models.